Hey, this is Kyler with Write and Direct. Blackmagic Design continues to blow me away with what they make available to us independent filmmakers. Here we have the Cinema 6K camera. It has the, the design, the form factor of the pocket cinema cameras, but the insides have been reworked as a full frame sensor. And I'm amazed at what you can get at the price points from Blackmagic Design. So I'm gonna walk you through using this camera. We're gonna start with the menu first, then we'll cover the external buttons because I think they'll make more sense once we cover the menu. So without further ado, I'm gonna power this thing on. On the LCD screen here on the top left, I'm gonna hit that button, and it's gonna bring up some tools on the bottom of the display. And these tools can also be accessed within the settings, but this is a fast access area. So starting with the first one down the lower left, this is Zebras. And you'll notice each of these tools have an on and off button. So you can toggle the tool on and off. So if I turn zebras on, it's gonna put stripes on any area of my image that is overexposed. I personally don't use zebras. I like to use false colors. We, as you know, we have another lesson on false colors, so I won't go into all that right now. But that's what zebras are for. If you wanna see quickly if anything is peaking, overexposed, you can turn that on. Next is focus assist. I use focus assist all the time because this is how you focus your image. And what it does is it puts in a red outline on whatever is in focus, and you can control the strength of it. By the way, you do the same thing with zebras. You can control the strength of it with the slider down here. Now here's my word of caution. I personally like to keep the red, the slider as low as I possibly can and still see focus, because for me, if it's too high and I see too much red, I really can't tell what's in focus. And I might think something's nice and crisp, and it's actually not. Now, Blackmagic Design's documentation says the higher level can help you delineate uh, areas on maybe an actor's face, on a close-up, things like that. Sure, fine, experiment with it, but as a rule of thumb, I keep it as low as I can. Okay, next we have Crop Guides. So if you enable this, you can scroll through various aspect ratios, and it's going to give you a guide to help you with framing. Now, this isn't cropping off any part of your image. It's using whatever sensor size you've selected, which we'll talk about in a second but it's just giving you a guide so that you can frame things correctly so that you don't have to move all your shots around later on in post-production, which can be kind of time consuming. And of course, you still have that media, you have still shot it, and if you do need to move something around in post, you can. Next is the grid. If you turn that on and, for example, choose thirds, this will just help you with your framing. If you're, for example, following the rule of thirds, like we've talked about with your framing of your talent. Next, we have a safe area. If you were, for example, shooting for broadcast or shooting a video where you know where there were gonna be some ads overlaying the image, you can set up your own safe area to, again, just help you with framing. And next is false colors. As you know, we already have a lesson on this, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but it helps you dial an exposure if you don't have a light meter. And I use it a lot, especially when I'm outside. If you have a middle gray card, you turn these on. Blackmagic Design's implementation of false colors is really good and it's just a fast way to get proper exposure with your camera. And the next is just the brightness of the LCD. I love this LCD. It goes up to 1500 nits, where the Pac Cinema camera, I think, peaked at around 450. So this is gonna be so much better for shooting outside when I'm trying to focus. It's amazing. So that's our quick access tools. I'm gonna hit that top left icon to get rid of those. And while we're looking at the bottom, let's just continue on there. The first thing on the lower left is the histogram, and this is just showing you the tonal range of your image. It's gonna show you if any of your RGB, red, green, blue values are peaking, and if anything's peaking, it's gonna show that over here on this little grid thing on the right. Next is your record button. It's just one of the ways to get this camera into record mode. I have an external SSD drive attached right now, and if I tap on that, I can choose format, and then highlight that media, hit format drive, and I choose either Mac OS Extended, or EXFAT, XFAT, I'm not sure how you say that. EXFAT will be, you can read that on a Mac, but it doesn't support journaling, and journaling can help you if you have any media issues. So if you're on a Mac, definitely use Mac OS Extended, and then just choose Format Drive, hit Format Drive again, and then you have to hold it down for three seconds, and then it'll start formatting. And click OK, then just hit Exit, and you're good to go. Now, a note on media, something else that's changed with this camera is the internal card and also the, the, the requirements for your external SSD. So you wanna check the Blackmagic Design website and look at the approved media list before you get media for this camera. Here's why. If you're shooting at the full capabilities of this camera at a, in a high frame rate, some 
media will not support that. And with that, according to Blackmagic Design, SSD drives, even the fastest ones you can get right now, this is the Samsung T9, it's really fast, but it cannot support write speeds as fast as an internal CF Express card. And then with that, not all CF Express cards are made equals. I will look at the approved media list, and then I'll go through all of those and look at the individual specs and decide what I want to get. So just be meticulous, don't cheap out on your media, because the last thing you want to do is have a problem with media when you're in production, and then like, what's the point of everything if you can't record correctly, right? Next, we have our audio levels down here on the lower right. And this audio is coming from the two onboard mics on this camera. And as we've talked about before, you always want to get camera audio so that you can sync your field recorder sound later on in post. And yes, you can run mics into this. We'll talk more about that in a second. But as you know, I always recommend get a legit field recorder, record your sound that way. Great. Now let's jump up to the top left to the right of the tool button. We have frames per second and you can touch these and change the settings here. Next is shutter. And right now I'm at an angle, so I'm at a 180 degree angle, which is which gives me proper cinematic motion blur like we've talked about for my 24 frames. In the settings, which we'll see, you can change it to, instead of angle, you can change it to a speed designation, and that doesn't change the internal workings of the camera. It's just another way to say, hey, I wanna, I wanna do the math, I wanna set the exact shutter speed that I want. Iris deals with f-stop, aperture. If you have a lens that talks to the camera, then you can set that here. This lens that I have on right now is just a manual lens, 100% manual, so it doesn't talk to it that way. Next is your time code, and then ISO, which we know about already. We've already learned about exposure in another lesson, but you can obviously tap that like anything else and change it. Then we have white balance, and then we have our power designation, shows you if you're plugged into power or if you're on a battery, how much you have left, etc. And then finally, this last icon, we can go into our settings. So let's go ahead and do that. And the menu of this will always take you back to where you left off. So if you've already been in the menu on your Cinema 6K, it's gonna, you're not gonna see this. So you wanna go to the record page, the record heading, and then there's multiple pages under each of these headings, and you can see which page you're on by looking on the dots on the bottom. So we wanna be on the first page, so just use your arrows on the side to navigate. And here we go. One big difference between the Cinema 6K and the pocket cameras is the lack of ProRes. You can no longer shoot in ProRes on this camera, which I never shot in ProRes. Blackmagic RAW is where it's at, so that's what I always use, so no loss there. Now with Blackmagic RAW, you can either shoot in the constant bitrate codec or the constant quality codec. And here's what you need to know. If you want the highest fidelity image, you want the maximum quality that you can get, then you need to be constant quality Q0. That's going to give you the best image. Now, what's the details here? What's the difference between these two? Constant bitrate keeps your footage recording at a certain bitrate area. So regardless of what's happening in the scene, whether it's just me talking to the camera with not much moving around, or it's an action scene that you're shooting, constant bitrate is just going to do the same. It's going to record the same bitrate and that's going to be based on which setting you choose, 3151811121. And that has to do with the amount of compression. Like 8.1, it's compressed sort of eight times more than it would have been just pure quality. That's kind of what that's about. Now you might think, okay, constant bitrate would be the best because you just set it to the highest. And then regardless of what's happening, we're getting the best image. But that's not how it works. Constant quality is a variable bitrate. So what that's going to do, if it's shooting right now, just me at a desk, and there's not a, a lot moving around, it's going to be at a lower bitrate because it's all this other stuff staying the same. But if it needs to, it can spike really high to get a better quality image. And it can spike higher than the highest setting of constant bitrate. So that's how constant quality is going to get you the best footage. So constant quality, Q0. Now I said constant bitrate deals with three to one compression, five to one compression, et cetera. Constant quality settings, Q0, Q1, Q3, and Q5 are dealing with quantization. And quantization is taking, mapping a large set of data to a smaller set of values. And the setting you choose here is gonna affect the math and how that's done. I don't understand all that. I'm just telling you Q0 is the best and Q5 is the lowest quality of constant quality. So let's jump down to resolution. 
The full frame sensor on this camera is a whopping 36 by 24 millimeters. This is a three by two or a one five to one aspect ratio. The Pocket 6K, for example, has a 23.1 by 1299 sensor, and the Pocket 4K has an 1896 by 10 millimeter sensor. So you can see this camera has a large sensor, right? Now what does that do for us? I mean, the Cinema 6K and the Pocket 6K are both shooting 6K. So what's the difference? Well, we've talked about this, remember? What is it? Photo sites. The photo sites on this sensor are larger because it's the same amount of photo sites gathering two 6K images, but the smaller sensor size on the Pocket 6K means smaller photo sites, and, and smaller photo sites can't capture as high quality of an image as larger, larger photo sites can. So that's what one thing a full frame sensor buys you. Now, if you look at the resolutions here, we have a bunch of different options to choose from. 6K open gate, open gate means it's using the entire sensor size. And that's the only one of these options that is in fact using the entire full frame sensor. All of these other options are windowing the sensor. Well, what do I mean by windowing? They're actually cropping off areas of your sensor. So we talked about in, in the settings with the guides, like guides for shooting anamorphic, those are just helping with framing, but still it's not chopping anything off. If you're shooting 6K open gate and using a guide, the full frame sensor is still being used. If I choose, for example, 6.5 anamorphic here, it's going to window the sensor down and only capture that area of the sensor. And so that's gonna mean less media requirements. So if I knew that I did for sure wanna lose all that, and I just wanted to frame up and I didn't need any wiggle room later, then windowing the sensor is going to have less of a storage requirement than just using guides on open gate, okay? Now obviously I get anamorphic footage by using an anamorphic lens. So I'll put an anamorphic lens on like that one right there and shoot 6K open gate and then I'm using the full sensor and getting an anamorphic image and that's the best way to go in my opinion. Now, all these other options, self-explanatory. 4K DCI, for example, it's windowing the sensor down to a 4K image. Now with that, what do you think the difference is in the 4K image of this and the 4K image of the Pocket 4K? Because the Pocket 4K's native sensor size is a 4K DCI image. So again, even though we're windowing the sensor down, it's still larger photo sites capturing that 4K image. So in theory, the 4K image off this should be better than the Pocket 4K. And I'm gonna do another lesson where I actually compare this camera with the Pocket 4K so we can see truly what's happening, but that's the theory. So you get it, I don't need to go through all these. Let's go to the next page by hitting the arrow and up in the top, dynamic range. So we've got video, extended video, and film. You always wanna shoot film. If you're color grading your movie, which we are, you wanna shoot in film mode, which gives you access to the full dynamic range of the image later on in Resolve when we're grading. And those images, as we've seen, as we've seen are very desaturated looking until we apply some color grading to them, bring them to like a Rec. 709 color space, et cetera. But all the data is there to work with. Now, if you're in a situation where you're not shooting narrative film and you were just shooting some commercial stuff for a client and they were gonna take that media from you there on set and you weren't gonna to get to touch it later, then yeah, shoot uh, video for your dynamic range and that's gonna put that in sort of a Rec. 709 color space and so when they look at the footage, it's not gonna look horrible. It's gonna be ready to go for them to just throw it up on their YouTube channel or whatever they're gonna do with it. So again, you gotta know what your, what your end goal is, but if it's us making our own movies and grading them, film mode all the time. Project frame rate, that's pretty self-explanatory. Off-speed recording, that's if you wanna do slow motion. So for example, if I turn this on, I can over here on the right, I can say, hey, shoot 36 frames a second in my 24 frame project. And what that's gonna do, it's gonna shoot 36 frames that will play back in the same amount of time as 24 frames a second on your timeline, which of course will give you slow motion. Now, a little word of caution, there's more than one way to turn this on, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you jump out of settings and look here on the LCD in the upper left, under frames per second, see how it says 36 slash 24? Well, if you ever see two numbers like that, that means you're in off-speed recording mode and you could be in big trouble if that's not what you're wanting to do. So you can tap that and turn it off right here, or you can go back into settings and turn it off in here. 
And one final note on that, your frames per second options are limited based on what resolution you choose. So if, you're, if I'm shooting 6K open gate, I can't go any higher than 36 frames. It just, the camera can't do it. But if I change that to 4K DCI, I can go up to 60 frames a second. Next, CF Express, USB-C, or a fullest card. What is this? It's just saying, hey, which media option do you want to be the default choice of the camera if you had two different types of media connected? Very self-explanatory. And you can always override that from your menu by going in and selecting it. And again, you know which one's active. If you jump out and look, the one that's highlighted in blue is the one it's recording to. Okay, let's hit the right arrow, go to the next record page, should be on page three. And we have time-lapse. If you're wanting to do any time-lapse footage, that's pretty self-explanatory. Detail sharpening, I don't do any detail sharpening camera. I do that later on in DaVinci Resolve. So I just leave that off. And if it drops any frames, for example, if you were using media that wasn't keeping up or there was a problem and it dropped a frame, you can say, hey, stop recording so that I know that this is happening. And that's what I leave it at because if frames are being dropped, I need to fix something. I don't want to get into post later and realize all my footage is messed up because it dropped frames. And then apply LUT and file. If I turn that on, what it's going to do, if I've loaded a LUT, a lookup table, into the camera for viewing purposes, then I can also kind of burn that into the footage, which with Blackmagic RAW, you're supposed to be able to just tick that off and resolve. So even if I had this on and it applied the LUT to the footage, the LUT's going to travel with the footage, but you can still disable that later. I never bake it in. I leave this off all the time. We're going to talk more about LUTs in just a second here in the menu, but that's what that's about. Okay, the next page, you can just specify whether you're shooting horizontal or vertical. I never shoot vertical. I'm not shooting videos for TikTok. So I just leave it at lock horizontal. I don't want to leave it at auto and have it choose for itself. Okay, so that's it for the record settings. Let's go to monitor. And this area allows us to customize things with our main LCD or an external display that we have connected to the camera. And so if you look here, LCD is obviously the built-in LCD. And then HDMI is the display connected to your HDMI port on the camera. And then viewfinder is if you have the optional viewfinder that you can plug into the top of this camera. And so each of these have their own different options. For example, on the LCD, I can say, hey, enable false colors all the time by default. And if I had another monitor always connected, I'm looking at that monitor to see what my set looks like. And I might want to just be able to glance down and look at false colors easily without having to turn that on and off. You get this. I'm not going to go through all of those in granular detail, but it's just a lot of nice options there. I'm going to go to the next monitor page. And starting with the middle, because the tops, again, if you move through these, it's changing the options for each LCD, HDMI out, viewfinder. So on my LCD, status text, that's, if I exit the menu here, status text is all the information on my screen. And I can say, hey, turn that all off. But I can also just swipe up on the LCD display, and all of that goes away at any moment. And I can swipe down and bring it all back. But if you want to turn it off, you can do that there. And the next item has to do with the default lower options on your display, and it defaults to meters. If I change that to Kodak and resolution, and hop back out, then you can see things are different. Now it's showing me which Kodak I'm using, and it shows me my resolution over on the lower right. And then also, on HDMI here, I can customize what's shown under the status text info based on whether the person looking at the external monitor is a cinematographer or the director, and it's going to show different information based on what those people typically would want to see. So you can play around with that if that interests you. I'm gonna jump back in. Anamorphic de-squeeze. So if I have an anamorphic lens on, I can say, hey, de-squeeze the image so that the image looks unsqueezed on my LCD, which is really nice, because it's hard to look at a squeezed image that's all squished up. So you can turn that on, and these settings change based on the resolution you've chosen. See, I'm at 4K DCI right now. So if I go back to record and do 6K open gate and then go back to monitor, my anamorphic option is different than if I was at, say, 4K DCI. And that should correspond with the lens you're using, like the Suri anamorphic lenses I'm using on this full frame camera are a 1.6, so that all matches up. Let's go to page three. The only thing I want to talk about here on page three is focus assist type. So we've already talked about focus assist. It highlights things in red when they're in focus, right? Well, that's called colored lines. If we changed it to peaking, what it's going to do is it's going to really sharpen and emphasize something that's in focus to set it apart from the things that aren't in focus. So you can see which one you like better. And then also back on colored lines, you can change the color from red to different colors if you prefer something different. Cool. 
Page four, here are just more defaults for the tools that we have quick access to on our main LCD. I don't need to walk through all of that, you get it. Go into the next page, same thing here, default LCD brightness, and then the focus chart and EVF smooth motion thing, these only apply to viewfinder. You won't be able to access those for LCD or HDMI. So that's it for monitor, now let's go on to audio. So as I've already said, there's two mics built into this camera and you want those gathering sound loud enough if you're shooting with an external mic and field recorder because you want Resolve to be able to match those up by WAV file later on in post-production. For example, one of the scenes I shot in Reckoning, I didn't have these set loud enough and so the camera audio was so weak because my actor was far away on a certain shot that I couldn't match it and so I had to do it by slate which is very time consuming. So just be aware of that. Make sure the levels are high. And then also you can change these. Let's say you weren't using a field recorder and you want to just plug a mic directly into your camera. You can do that. Camera left here right now, defaulting to the left mic. I can change that to XLR1 mic or I can change that to XLR1 line. So what's line? Line is if you did have a field recorder but you also wanted to record that signal to the camera itself. So you're recording in the field recorder and at camera, maybe it's a safety, whatever. Same for the second channel. You can have a second mic plugged in, etc. Okay, let's go to page two. This top line lets you customize the type of audio meters that are shown on the LCD. And then, of course, headphone volume, speaker volume is pretty self-explanatory. The speaker comes into play if you're playing back footage on set and you wanna see a take. And then, of course, headphone volumes. If someone's monitoring from the camera, if you're recording audio into the camera, or you just wanna hear what you're getting, that's what you would do here. All right, cool. So that's it for audio. Let's go to setup. Setup page one is very self-explanatory. If you want to name the camera, if you want it to be camera A, camera B, just stuff for recording things for production. If you want to see what firmware version you're at, that's all right here. I'm gonna to go to page two, and here's where I mentioned earlier you could change the camera from using shutter angle or shutter speed, so that's where you would do that. And then flicker-free shutter based on, if you're in North America or in an NTSC area, you want it to be 60 hertz, if you're PAL, then you want it to be 50 hertz. Then drop frame time code and lens stabilization. First, if you have a lens that has its own stabilization stuff that it can do, which some do, then you can turn that on and off here. And then drop frame time code is a very specific thing that really doesn't affect us anymore. I had to deal with this when I first got into filmmaking, non-drop and drop frame. And for the most part, you never have to deal with that. If you're shooting your own movies, you definitely don't have to deal with that. But if you were working for production, for broadcast, for some unique requirement, and they're like, hey, we need drop frame time code, they would tell you because that's a big deal. Okay, let's go to page three. So here's where we can map function buttons on our camera, which is really nice. And we're gonna talk about these buttons in a minute, but there's three function buttons up here. And we can go in here and say, hey, I want function button one to behave as a preset or a toggle. So let's say a toggle. And then down here I can say, and I want to turn on false colors for my LCD. And that would mean then if I jump out of my settings and I hit F1, it's gonna turn false colors on and off. Next page, gonna ignore this. This has to do with attached Blackmagic Design hardware in the next page as well. Gonna skip that. And now we have tally light LED. The tally light is the little red record light, so you can adjust whether that's on or off. Do you want the display to auto dim after 10 minutes, five minutes, etc., which is good, it saves battery if you're on battery. The playback function on the camera, you can say, hey, load up all the clips I've shot when I hit playback and I'm gonna scroll through all of them or do it one at a time. Let's go to the next page. This area, I have not played around with in detail yet and I can't wait to because I think there's some function, some capabilities with this camera to transfer files from it over Wi-Fi. But this is where you'd set that up. And so in the next page is Bluetooth. So if I turn this on, I can connect this camera to certain Bluetooth devices. For example, my external, dis my external display, my monitor, will connect via Bluetooth and I can control menu functions from that display if I wanted to. Or even cooler, you can get the Black Magic Design camera app on your phone and then you can connect to this camera via Bluetooth and what it's gonna do, when you do try to connect in the phone app, it's gonna show a code here that then you didn't type into the phone and it sort of authorizes the connection, the pairing. And then once you've got them paired, you can start and stop record and change settings on your camera from your phone, which is awesome. It's amazing. Like, again, I'm blown away by what they give us in the price range that this stuff falls into. 
On this final settings page, we can do a factory reset of the camera. I've only done this once, and it wasn't on this camera, it was on a Pocket 4K. When I first got it, it was doing some funky stuff, and I had to do a factory reset, and it fixed it, and then I never had the problems anymore. So if you ever run into a really weird error that you know for sure is not normal, a factory reset will put it back to the all the default settings, which you're going to have to then reset things up, but worst case scenario, that's that's there for you. And then going to the right, motion sensor calibration. So this has to do with the gyro, gyro, however you say that, stabilization in DaVinci Resolve. If you know you're going to be taking advantage of that later on in post, before you shoot, you want to calibrate your motion sensor. So just put this on a flat surface and tap that and it'll do it. Next on down, pixel recalibration. Sometimes on all digital cameras, a pixel can eventually turn hot. And if you see any of that in an image, once you've used your camera a ton, I've never run into that, but if you see that, you can calibrate your image sensor here to fix that. And then the last one, LCD white balance calibration. If you touch that and hit adjust, it's going to let you adjust the white balance of your LCD. So if things look kind of off, you can fix that here and then you can save it. And that's the final page of settings. Next is presets. Once you get everything dialed in exactly how you want it for a certain production or workflow or whatever, you can just click the plus sign here, name a preset, and then you have it available to just choose and then hit the check mark to select it and then it'll configure the camera automatically. And you can import presets, you can export them to save them as backups, import them to another Cinema 6K, etc. And then also a note on that. Let's say you can have multiple presets obviously. Let's say I was on my Theater 11 Pictures preset, but then I went to the record page and I changed from constant quality Q0 to Q3. Well, what that's done now, it's dumped me into a new custom configuration beginning with my Theater 11 Pictures preset. So I have two options now. I can either go back to presets and highlight my existing one and click this arrow circle icon here to update it, or I can click plus and create a new preset based on these settings. So it's gonna take my Theater 11 Pictures settings, that tweak I made and create a new preset, okay? And then also you can delete a preset by highlighting it and hitting the trash can. And then to edit one, like the name, you can hit the pencil and then to import or export the double arrows. Cool, now let's go to LUTs. LUTs stands for lookup tables. We know this, we've talked about it. And so here's how these come into play. If we're shooting film mode, as we know, the image is very desaturated. It's like a, it's a log mode image. And so it can be helpful when you're on set to see what it's really gonna look like later on. Because even though you know you've got your exposure dialed in and all that, when everything's really desaturated, you might not catch something maybe with production design that's not how you want it to be, or it just it won't hit you the same. So what you can do is you can either choose one of these included lookup tables. For example, Gen 5 film to video on the bottom is going to give you kind of a Rec 709 look, but just on your monitor. It's not doing anything to your footage. And this is where that other setting that we already covered earlier comes into play. If you go back to record and go to the third page, apply LUT and file. So if you've selected LUT and you enable this, it's going to bake that LUT into your file. And so the LUT's gonna travel with your footage. And from what I've read, you can turn that off with bra footage in DaVinci Resolve clip by clip. So it's not necessarily ruining your footage, but I never bake it in, and I haven't tested that by the way, that's just what I've read on their documentation. So you can test that if you want to. But it is nice to have a LUT on your display monitor. And so again, you could go back to the monitor page. Let's say you did select the Gen 5 film to video. You can go back to monitor and say you only want to see that on your HDMI connected monitor. So then you can go to HDMI and display 3D LUT. And it's going to show that LUT here only, okay? So that's, that's what LUTs are for. And then you can also hit the double arrow here and import a LUT. It's a, three, a 3D LUT. It's a cube file. And you can just put it on your CF Express card or your SSD media and you can import that into your camera. And that's really it for the, the camera settings. So hopefully all that makes sense. Now, when you jump out, if you swipe left or right, it takes you to sort of the digital slate area of your camera. If you wanna name your takes and put metadata information in with the clips for using in post-production later, this is where you would do that. You can go to the project and you can give it a name, the director, et cetera. This is not information that changes anything. It's just 
information that's nice to have in the metadata of your clips. So in DaVinci Resolve, I can click on a clip, look at the metadata, and it'll say, hey, this was the ACAM, this was take whatever, etc. if for any reason I needed that information there. Now, when I'm doing everything on my own sets, I don't have time to mess with this, but if you had a full-time camera operator and you wanted that, this is where it is. And then the third option here is lens data. If you have a lens that can communicate to the camera, then it will pre-populate some of the stuff for you. But you can also manually type it in. Now here's the one thing you need to know. If you're taking advantage of the stabilization features of this later on in DaVinci Resolve, your camera needs to know what the focal length is of your lens. This is important. So you would go here to focal length, and let's say I was using a 50, I just type in 50, hit millimeter, and click update, and now that has the information the camera needs to know for proper image stabilization. All right, so I'm gonna X that. And so now let's look at our buttons and our inputs here. Let's just start on the very top. We've of course got on and off button, and we've got our three function buttons that we can map to different things. And we've got ISO, shutter, and white balance buttons. What it's gonna do is gonna take you right to that area in your menu, and then you can use this front dial if you want to scroll through options or of course change it on your LCD. And then we have our primary record button and then a button to take photos. And then also we have another record button right here. Now let's look at the back menu options. This top button controls f-stop and aperture. Again, if you have a lens that talks to the camera. If you don't, like my manual lens here, I hit this, it does nothing because they're not talking to each other. And then the button below that is autofocus, same thing applies. And then the four buttons below this, HFR, dumps you into that off-speed recording. So if you accidentally hit that, you're gonna see it in the top left here, it's gonna change. And so you can turn that on and off here or you can turn it on and off in the menu. And then the second button down is super handy for focus assist. If you punch in, it's gonna magnify and you can drag your image around on the LCD to be able to see what you're trying to focus on. And then you can pull focus and it's easier to pull focus obviously if it's magnified. Now a little word of warning, don't forget to turn that off. I've been on, on set, I punch in, pull focus, get distracted and leave it punched in and then I frame my shot up that way only to realize later, ah, totally framed wrong. And then you gotta redo it. So always jump back out. And then the next button is just another way to get into settings. And the final button lets you play back media that you've recorded. So you have very common sense things here, play, stop, skip, etc. And to get out of this playback area, you can hit any of your record buttons and it'll take you out. It won't start recording. That's just how you get back to your normal camera mode. And then you can hit record again to begin recording. On the left, we've got our USB-C inputs. We've got different audio inputs on the top, headphone jack, we've got our, our power. And one difference between the Cinema 6K and Pocket 4K is this camera has two mini XLR inputs for mics, whereas the Pocket 4K only had one. And then the right side is where you, you pull this back and you can eject your media, insert your CF Express cards, and there we go. If you have any questions, of course, post in the comments. I'm doing another video comparing footage from the Pocket 4K with this camera. So it's gonna show quality differences, but also field of view differences because we're going from MFT to full frame. So even with the same focal length lens, that changes your field of view. And the field of view of, is, of course, what the camera and lens combo sees, all right? So look for that video soon, and I hope to see you on the channel ongoing. And listen, if you are an aspiring filmmaker and you want to learn how to do the craft, check out Write Direct, writedirect.co. Write and Direct is my online film school designed to do one thing, help you realize your dreams faster because I did the normal thing. I went to film school, moved to Los Angeles, and yeah, it was fun, I learned a lot, but you know what? I took out a $60,000 school loan, and you realize when you do that that no one's gonna hire you because you went to film school. And if you don't believe me, call up any studio in LA and, and pick your school. Say, hey, I just graduated from UCLA with honors, and I am looking for a job you're not gonna get anywhere because of that degree. So that can be kind of scary if you spend a lot of time and money on film school. So my goal with Write and Direct is to take you from development through post-production so that you know how to 
you understand the craft and you know how to do everything to some degree, not so that you can just control and do everything yourself all the time, but when you're first starting out, if you can't afford to pay crew, then you've got to know how to do lighting. You, know, you have to know how to do sound, run the camera, do post-production, and so much more. And pushing all of that to the side, it all begins with story. So we cover all of that and write, write and direct for a fraction of the cost of traditional film school. So I hope to see you there, and if not there, I'll see you on the channel very soon.